welcome to episode 26 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that is dedicated to lots and lots of movies that we love or don't love. But this week, you're going to find out what we think about this bunch. But before we jump into it, I'm Karen Emroff, and here are my co-hosts, Christy Prochko and Angie Hahn. Hello! Hello. All right, so the ones that we're covering this week, first we're doing our favorite childhood movies, then we're going to talk about Ninja Turtles, and then we are going to talk about The One I Love. And we're going to kick it off with those childhood movies. So, Angie, you've got that one. All right. So this, so you know, as Harry just noted, one of the things we're talking about this week is Ninja Turtles. But before we talk about that, we thought that we would talk about you know other movies that we grew up with and loved as children. So I'm going to go first. And my favorite movie when I was You're a child. You're so giddy right now. I am. It's Angels in the Outfield. And if you know me in person and you've talked to me quite a bit, then you've probably heard me talk about this movie before because I was obsessed with it when I was a child. And I, you know, I'll be honest. Like you know, I want to try to pretend like I'm like a serious film person on a serious film podcast talking about serious film things, but one of the main reasons I loved it when I was a kid was because Joseph Gordon-Levitt was one of my fa- like earliest childhood crushes, so I've been crushing on him since I was, I guess, about 10. Um, but beyond that, like, it's just, it's it's not, like, a good movie by, like, my standards when I see it today. It's not horrible, but it's, like, very, like, cheesy and tri- treacly, and there's some, like, weird fucked up moments, like, when the angel is, like, I, I mean, do, do I have to explain the plot, do you think? I can. Yeah, okay. just like, like in case someone didn't see All right. it. So Joseph Gordon-Levitt is this like little boy who I don't I think his mom's dead and his dad is Dermot Mulroney I think right, um, and his and his dad is like a deadbeat dad so he so Joseph Gordon-Levitt lives in the foster home, and he's like Daddy, Daddy, when are we gonna be a family again? And then the daddy's like I'd say when the angels win the pennant and the angels. Oh my the- god, I'm like having so many feelings remembering this scene. Go on. <laughs> The angels in this movie are doing, like, terribly. I don't know if at that point in actual baseball history they're doing terribly, but in the movie they're doing terribly. So then, But then the boy is, like, 10, so he takes this very literally, and then that night he's like, he's like, God, God, please just, just let the angels win the pennant so that we can be a family again, right? And then God actually hears and then sends down Christopher Lloyd, who is an angel. Oh my god, I'm listening to myself talk right now. I'm like, say, what? You know, I don't remember it being this cheesy, I guess because I haven't seen it since I was a kid, but yeah, that that's really tacky. <laughs> I rewatched it at some point. Um, I think I hadn't seen it in many years, and then one of the last times I was home, my brother and I like found the old cassette tape, the one I just showed you, the VHS tape, and we rewatched it, and we were laughing our asses off because this movie is actually really dumb, but it's one of those things that I'll just like never not love because I loved it when I was a kid, and I can't be objective about it. <laughs> um, and the the weird thing is like there's like a lot of like random people in this movie like Matthew McConaughey is in it he like plays a baseball player Adrian Brody's in it he also plays a baseball player like you you watch it and you're just like oh I, it's just I don't know it's it's we weird need to rewatch this as a group I think <laughs> they don't have huge roles and then um. Oh, fuck, what's his name? The guy, Tony Danza. Tony Danza, who starred in Joseph Gordon-Levitt's directorial debut, Don John, last year, is in this. Oh, my uh, God, I didn't... You, I forgot that happened. I, I'm pretty sure that's actually, like, how they know each other. I'm not even kidding, because Joseph Gordon-Levitt was, like, 10 when he made this, so they probably just met each other for the first time on this movie. Tony, I'm all grown up now. Come be in my softcore movie. Yeah, basically. Um, so yes, this movie's a delight, and I could talk about it forever, but I think that you guys want to talk about your favorite movies, so I'll let it go. But yes, um, <laughs> movie that I could never be objective about that I... Well, okay, I can be a little objective enough to know that it's like not a good movie, but seriously, I'm just always going to love it. It's always going to have a special place in my heart, even though... If someone told me about this movie now, I'd just be like, just, just fucking like spoon my eyes out. Like it's hor- that sounds awful. I would never watch this. That's intense. Yeah. I'm glad I don't have to be that intense because the movie I picked is actually still really good today, and it is. Oh. <gasps> <I remember laughs> Christmas. Wait, I'm not done. There's more. There's more in my apartment. I love this. This makes oh, me really wow. freaking happy. See, everyone has like the the, the Jack, but you've even got the. 
Uh, oh, yeah. Name. And, and you know, I have a really awesome Mondo poster hanging in my kitchen that if I could go in there and take it off the wall and show it to you, I would. It's somewhere on my Twitter and Instagram account, though. But yeah, some I nice freaking... Yeah, with Perry. Yeah, Sarah, you know, sometime we should do that because I have some pretty freaking no, cool you're art out there. No, you're swanky. People don't need to see my apartment. There's, like, lots of random fun things to look at around here, like, including a cat who's named after a movie, so he would fit. But anyway, Nightmare Before Christmas is so freaking special to me. I must have taken, like, my parents and my grandparents. I remember dragging my grandparents to the theater to sit through that. Like, God, I had to have seen it in the theater, like, four or five times. Then I had to have the VHS. And on top of that, I had to ha I had to have the sheet music, and like I can't play piano for the life of me. But like I would always try to play the songs on the piano, and I'd be like, "Mom, look, I'm doing it." And she's just like, "You can't play piano. Stop that." When you said you can't play piano, did you literally not know how to play the piano, or was it like you were taking lessons? I took not no. At I it? took uh, lessons when I was a kid. You know, me and Lonnie both had that problem. We took lessons with fuck. What was her name? Miss Mrs. Levy. Her name was Mrs. Levy, and she was like this teeny little old like woman, and we'd sit on the piano bench together, and she'd try so hard to teach the two of us. And like I think I tried hard and just like couldn't get it. I'm I'm good at other instruments, not the piano. But anyway, I tried playing Nightmare Before Christmas music and it just didn't happen. But like, you know, even still to this day, when those songs come on, it's not like like cheesy musical type shit. It's like I listen to it and I know the words and I still love it and I still love the clips and I still love the imagery. It's just something that never went away and like especially now that I've kind of grown up and I'm allowed to have this obsession with horror also because like there's not really very... I always say this because my two favorite things in the world are horror movies and movies with like cute animated creatures in them and this is really one of very few that combines them. And, like, some of the imagery with the crossover with Halloween and Christmas, that's some of my favorite stuff out there. And I am obsessed with this movie. Everyone should watch this movie. The stop motion in it blows my mind. And the more stuff I can find to put in this apartment that is related to that movie, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I did not love the movie as much as you did when I was a kid, but I remember liking it a lot. And even now as an adult when, you know, I see clips of it or pictures of it, I'm just like, wow, that's a really, like, cool-looking movie. It's awesome, yeah. and that's. But it made me a little disappointed with Frankenweenie, because like I thought Frankenweenie was gonna be like my new Nightmare Before Christmas. Not that I was hoping it would be better than it, but then that it would just like you know bring out all those feelings that I had again, and you know it didn't. But also because I'm just like really weird when it comes to animals getting hurt, and I just cried through that whole movie. Aww. That's kind of a fitting segue to where my my pickle pick uh, take us. So. Um, one of my favorite movies from when I was a kid was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I remember distinctly in school, everybody played Turtles. I know there are going to be people now, like, proclaiming, because whatever, they're going to be saying, it's a boy movie, whatever. That movie, everyone at my school was into. Everybody had their favorite. Mine was, was Raph, because Raphael had, like... He had like, a, he had, like, a chip on his shoulder, and he was tough, and I liked him. And he walked around in a trench coat. And, like, this had, like, April O'Neil, like, out in the city and taking on danger. And she was too busy to have nice hair. And she just had, like, she was living the dream, being a journalist, wearing a jumpsuit. It was amazing. And then you had Casey Jones, who, guys, Casey Jones. <laughs> like, I was too young to understand what was happening, but I was having a hardcore crush on Elias Codius as, or I don't know how you say his name. Uh, Elias Codius. There you go as Casey Jones, because he was like, he was tough, and he was fighting crime in his own way, and the Turtles didn't respect his lack of honor, and they had all confrontations, and, and like, this movie was just so much fun, and I know that it looks a little silly now, because yes, they're clearly guys in rubber suits with puppets <laughs> with very, very simple facial expressions, and you got Corey Feldman goofing around in there. I don't care, man. That was a really fun movie, and I watched it recently, and it's still really fun. It's just... Um, and also, it made New York seem like a place that was both dangerous and amazing. And, like, you know, I was a small-town kid that was, like, dreaming hardcore of going to New York City, where I was convinced most movies took place. And uh, this one did. And it was awesome and fun and crazy. And the turtles were, like, tough, but also goofy. And I think as a kid, you want something goofy that you could enjoy, but you also want the feeling of having power. And the turtles gave people that. And I... 
you know, go Ninja Go! Like, the turtles were amazing. I was a big Ninja Turtle kid. I liked the uh, the cartoon, I had all the toys, and I adored the first and the second movie. Which which is the one where they go to, like, and they become, like, samurais? Is that that was the third. That's the one I know, everybody I know has seen the third one. I've because, seen it. Yeah, well, but I, you don't really I watch mean, it. I, I liked it as a kid. I must have watched it a couple times when I was young. I would never think to put it in now, whereas I kind of really do want to go and watch the first one again. Whereas I own the first two. The third so one I will borrow oh, yeah. one of those. Movie yeah. day. <laughs> we'll yeah, watch, I don't think... We'll I don't watch think... that after Winter's Tale, after Angels in the Outfield. Oh my god, our list is getting long. We have like a popcorn and Prosecco Netflix queue now. Um, yeah. I, 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 I can I just don't... imagine a time lapse of us getting drunker and more terrible and just... <laughs> What's wrong with that? that. <laughs> All right, I think that's about it for childhood movies, especially because uh, Christie's oh, no. was such a good what? I, I just set up a segue. Know. I do this one. Mm -hmm. Oh uh -oh. no, I was saying Christie's pick gives uh -oh. us a good segue. For if you had let me finish the sentence, Perry, you would have seen slow. where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yes, Perry, take it away. Okay. So, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Jonathan Liebsman's version, is about, this pains me to say it, it's about April O'Neil, not really the turtles, because April, she does, like, puff pieces for a local news station, and she's not happy about that. She really wants to be a hard news reporter, so she decides to go and, like, find the news on her own. There's a lot of Foot Clan activity, so she wants to investigate the crime and then bring it back to her boss, who's... Whoopi Goldberg and be like, look what I found. Hire me as a hard news reporter. And while she's doing that, she encounters the turtles. And like you see in the trailer, she climbs up and she takes that picture. And then they kind of realize that they're connected in a way. And that spirals out of control. And they all have to work together to fight the Foot, the foot Clan and Shredder and the scientific effort to, like, extract what the turtles are to make something evil. It's really hard saying all this without trying to spoil everything, not that it's worth not spoiling this movie, but that's basically what it's about. It's it's mainly about April's like quest to become a reporter and how that lands her with the turtles, and then they just fight this evil force, and that's pretty much it. Um, it's not good. I'm sure you could probably tell by the tone and the way I describe that that it's not a very good movie. It's pretty poorly written, and it drove me off my mind that this movie is about April and Vern Fenwick, who is played by Will Arnett, and he's April's Yeah, everybody's Superman favorite Turtles Turtle. character, Vern Fenwick. I remember even when they announced the casting, everyone was just kind of like, wait, who? Because it was like, no one's, I guess he's like not a character they made up for the movie, but like nobody has been clamoring to see See, Vern that Fenwick. wouldn't even have mattered, though, because there's so many iconic characters in this movie anyway big deal if you introduce someone that like nobody really knows, but at least make him an interesting character and make them fucking supporting characters. This is yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is supposed to be about the Ninja Turtles. And you know what? The best parts about this movie were with the Ninja Turtles, not Megan Fox and Will Arnett. Who cares about them? I well, disagree. Megan... Go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to say two things. First of all, I disagree because I had some problems with the turtles, but we'll get to that in a bit. And second, I think I think Christy may have, may have been about to say a similar thing. Like, it wouldn't have been so bad if April were a more interesting character, but, I mean, she's played by Megan Fox, who is not a great actor. I don't she's know whether Megan... Actor. I'm not allowing Megan Fox to be called an actress anymore because all she does is have the same haircut in every movie and she has two faces. She has she's this Megan one. Fox in this movie, yeah. Like, she's not... And, like, I don't know... I don't want to... I don't know if Megan Fox is smart in real life or not, but I don't think that she's good at, like... She's Megan Fox on the screen. She's Megan Fox in every movie, though. I, you exactly. know, I think I think that there is a decent actress in there, but until they wipe some of that damn makeup off and stop making her hair look so perfect, it's just going to be impossible to detach her from the celebrity she I, is. I don't know that I've ever seen anything though where I felt like she was acting. I feel like every movie they give her the same like long blonde plaits of, or long brown plaits of, plaits of hair, and she makes these two faces. But like sometimes, sometimes I mean, and Jen, Jen makes the faces. It keeps cutting away. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, there's happy face. It's not cutting me. What's happening? It's going. It's on you. Yeah. Okay. It's ha, ha. And then there's this one. And this look here is easily 60% of screen time in the Turtles movie. I don't know. I'll semi-disagree with that. I don't think she's anything great. She doesn't bring anything to the role. Not that there was anything there in the script to begin with. 
But I will say that I saw her try. This was like she put effort into this performance. I think she did put effort into it. And I've seen like have, if you have you guys seen Jennifer's Body? I, I love did. Jennifer's Body. Like I that's a, that's a role where it's not like she's being asked to do anything like to like really stretch her capabilities and it's not like she gives a Meryl Streep performance but I thought that that was a, a movie that a, That's just so well better done. than the movies that she usually picks and that made good use of what she's actually able to do this one it needed her to like seem like kind of like smart and determined and have personality especially because like it's not like the script is helping her here no like, the script's garbage like let's to be fair it's not completely Megan Fo well, Fox's fault that April O'Neil is like a shitty character that they're clip. not they don't give her much to work with yeah if you've seen that clip where she's explaining to Whoopi Goldberg's character who again? I don't know why we have to meet Whoopi Goldberg's character. Whatever, but like, she's I think there was a subplot that got cut. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a lot of stuff that got cut. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't knit together. That you feel like there's a lot of changes that were made in post. But anyway, there's a scene where she, we, which has been the clip they keep showing everywhere, where she's explaining to her boss Whoopi Goldberg about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and she's like, they look like this, and she points to a picture of a turtle that none of them look like. And it's just like, her job, April O'Neil's job, is to tell people the news in stories using proof so they can they understand things are real. She is terrible at her job. She can't put, put, string together a sentence. She can't find cohesive evidence at all. And then, you know, didn't she gets she fired. That, didn't she have that picture on her phone at the time? She did, but she didn't show that. Yeah, but then she goes and shows it She's to like, Eric Sachs, who like immediately recognizes that these are mutant turtles. So she would have just shown that to Whoopi Goldberg. Like, yeah, she story. shows Whoopi Goldberg another piece of quote unquote evidence that the to picture, anyone who's not an insane person would be like, that doesn't make any sense. The picture, by the way, which the turtles were said like eight times before she shows it to someone. Yeah, we erased all the pictures on her phone. So the turtles are not good at their job either. That's it's true. The fact that they have like a tech because they gave their... her back the phone they, is the problem. They're like they didn't. They, they made they, a like, point of that though. Like that, they're they're not like experts. They screw up. They're just kids. They have like a fucking tech genius on their team. I think they should be able to handle deleting some fucking pictures, especially because apparently they deleted other ones. So it's just that it's just like well, this they did, one photo they forgot to they delete. They deleted the photos, but then, and then she, she took more and ran away. Is that so what it was? Yeah, yeah, she it takes more plan. as they're All jumping right, from the roof. Yeah, it just it's credit for that. Is, we spent so much time. I mean, this movie should be called April o April O'Neil. That's what it should be called. And unfortunately, I don't want there to be an April O'Neil movie because this April O'Neil is boring as hell. And beyond that, like she is mostly looked at like she's basically a plot facility where she runs around and gets in trouble so people can rescue her, or she leans over things so that either uh, Will Arnett's pervy character can leer at her or sex pest Michelangelo can leer at her. Yeah, I think that was actually the thing that I hated the most about there's this movie. Turtle is that like joke. Yeah, so the so there's the turtles and I don't think I know you guys have said that you wish there was more of the turtles, but I kinda feel like maybe the way Christy feels about April O'Neil, which is that like I guess in theory that sounds good, but not. I don't want to see more of the turtles if they're going to be like this because most of them don't really have that much personality. The one that has the most personality is fucking Michelangelo, who once again, you know, he's like always been like kind of the goofy, immature comic relief character. But in this one, that goofy, immature comic relief thing takes the form of him like just relentlessly hitting on Megan Fox. So I mean. The, fir for the first time she meets them, she basically gets, like, you know, she's, like, kind of, like, sneaking up on them, and then they basically, like, drag her to the rooftop, where it's just these four hulking, like, over six foot tall, like, creatures, and her, and then, like, Michelangelo, like, immediately the first thing he says is, like, uh, he's, like, she's so hot, she's making my shell feel tight, and I was just, like, wow, imagine if you were a girl, and you got dragged into a rooftop by, like, four hulking men, and one of them said that. I was, like... It is someone yeah. about to, like, rape April O'Neil? Like, what is going on here? And, and then, then later, they spent the movie. And he says more creepy things about how, like, you know, like, it's, it's, I don't remember what it is exactly, but they have a bag over her head, and he's again trying to hit on her, and it's like, she isn't in such an awkward position right now for him to hit on her is just really uncomfortable. And it's like, Michael's always been, or Michelangelo's always been kind of flirty, and there's a difference, though, between flirty and what this character does. It's just, it's un, it's unsettling. And it's this like, Michael's the only joke. They, they beat the joke to death. That yeah. was the big problem with it, but I will say I found more of it funny than you guys did. I don't know. I think like, I, I laughed out loud like, a couple of times when were, all of a sudden he popped up in like the heat of a moment and said something, and I'm like, oh, you you you're still doing that. But there were I think that if, I think that if they had 
had fewer of the jokes and maybe not started out with direction joke, yeah. then I might have just been like, oh, haha, that's cute, whatever. I'm, I'm not yeah, even found some of it amusing. But the it's relentlessness not, yeah. of it never allowed me to think it was funny. It just like just became like, oh my god, just just stop, just stop. You're every guy at like every bar that keeps like hitting on the girl even after she has told you eight exactly. times, no, I don't want to get a drink with you. Michelangelo is the guy that you steer your girlfriends away from. Yes, That's he's the guy. one that you guys like. You know what? You know when you do that thing where your friend is being relentlessly hit on, so everyone just kind of like closes in around her, and you guys all try really hard to ignore that guy. Michelangelo is that guy in the movie. Yeah. It's horrible. Um, the other person, the really other like. don't get that much personality beyond that. I mean, they don't have a lot of time. Uh, it's because yeah. it's because yeah. they don't have enough screen time. Like there could have been something really interesting between Leonardo and Raphael with that brother dynamic, but that wasn't. They didn't dig into that whatsoever, except yeah, for just like no. flat out saying it expositionally. And yeah, like they had time the for one like scene where I feel like the one scene where I felt like they got the turtles right. I think Angie on your site, you guys called it the best scene in the movie. Is just I didn't because I hadn't seen it at that point, but it is one of the better scenes in the movie. It's just the four four turtles in an elevator waiting to go fight Shredder, and this isn't a spoiler because you know it's going to happen, whatever. And like they're waiting patiently, and then Mikey just starts like dinging his things together and being like. MC might be. And then, you like, could watch it online now. They released yeah. it a couple days watch ago. Watch that clip because that clip is by far, like, that. in that moment, you're like, yeah, this is what we like about the tur Turtles. They're these big, tough guys, but they can be goofy and silly, and we love them. And, like, that's kind of the problem. Like, Plat Platinum Dunes and all that, they, they looked at the Turtles and they were like, oh, we need Turtles for a new generation. We need them to be bigger and tougher and have more junk on them. They have so much stuff on They're them. They're all dressed like Johnny Depp. Like, yeah. if you've seen Johnny Depp on the red carpet in the last five years, that's what they're all dressed like. Just, like, weird little, like, necklaces and bits and bobs and, like, rags tied around them. And like I, I liked that. I liked the definition on them. But see, that's it, it made, made them all stand out. Like, I loved I loved Donatello's whole headset with his glasses. I, I That I all really If liked. it were building character, that's one thing. But it's, like, it's the only thing. For, for that, a lot of it, it's the only thing reliant. It's, like, the character's reliant well, on these touches because they didn't spend time creating characters. They were just, that, like, yeah, oh, that's, shells on him. That's Mikey not necessarily the VFX design people's fault. They they made these great turtles, but then the script just never gave the turtles any time and never did any character you know, development. You're right, and I think that I think that it's, you know, you're, it's, it's not the VFX people's fault fault necessarily it's just it just gross. like all together it didn't feel like it I don't, it didn't feel like the movie cared that much about the turtles as characters one of the reasons i like that beatbox scene too was because uh it's one of the it's one of the very few moments of the movie where you actually get to like feel the camaraderie between these four turtles. Yeah. Otherwise, they kind of just do this thing where they're like running around. They keep saying, "Yeah, we're brothers, we're brothers." But you 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 I kept feeling like they were telling me that they were brothers, and the movie wasn't actually showing me like, okay, but you know what like what really ties them together? What is like the actual family dynamic it's remarkable like? Remarkable how, and I think we can all agree on this. This movie lost focus of what people wanted to see in a Ninja Turtle movie, which was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, that's my big, that's my biggest complaint with this movie. I'd say overall, I didn't dislike it that much. I was pretty entertained from beginning to end. I might not have been totally satisfied, but I was entertained, somewhat engaged, and you know, it's only. A little over, maybe ninety minutes long. So it's not like Transformers, where you waste two and a half hours of your life. I just walked out and I'm like, yeah, you know, it that, just feel, that was like kind of entertaining. Know. But but it wasn't really what I wanted. As someone who loved Ninja Turtles as a kid, it didn't bring back any of those feelings, which is the biggest bummer of the whole thing. Yeah, it's yeah, just like if you're would... talking about pizza and you're like, no, I get it. I get that they like pizza. I remember that too. But that's not enough. Yeah, I, hated I think, this. I think I hated Harry this hit movie. the nail on the head with what I personally didn't like about it, which is that uh, it didn't bring back the feeling of watching Ninja Turtles as a kid. But even on an impersonal level, like even if you've never seen the Turtles, this movie should work for you. And I feel like it doesn't really work on that level either because it's just not a very good movie. The acting's not very good. The character's not very well drawn. The, plots doesn't, the plot doesn't really make any sense. The so action comes down for me. Yeah. All right, I think you guys all get where we're going with this one, unfortunately, which makes me pretty sad. But on to another one. Christy, do you want to take it? Well, I feel like we should make clear part of the reason that normally we save the big movie till last, but there's two reasons where we swiped it up, swiped, uh, switched around this week. One was because we really didn't like Turtles and we didn't want to go out on such a downer note. And the other one is our final movie 
is really interesting, but it's got a twist that makes it hard to talk about. So what we're going to do is the first half we're going to talk about and review the movie without giving away the spoiler, and then the last part of the uh, episode will be just talking about this movie with spoilers. So this movie is called The One I Love, and it's been by Charlie. Or it's directed by Charlie McDowell, and it stars Elizabeth Moss and Mark Duplass. They play a married couple who have been... Basically, they're on the kind of verge of breaking up, and to kind of save their marriage, they go to a marriage counselor who suggests that they go to a cabin and spend a weekend and just get to know themselves afresh, and in that time, you know, maybe they can save their relationship. And I know that sounds just kind of like a, I don't know, like another indie drama about relationships, but there's something really interesting and smart going on here. Um, it's a very subversive and kind of wickedly funny comedy that uh, I think if you take a date to, it'll be a really interesting date. You know, I spoke it to uh, Mark Duplass the other day, and I asked him, I'm like, you know, if you wanted to sell this movie to people, how would you describe it? Because you have to describe it in a way that they're not just going to think this is another relationship drama. And he's like, the only way you can do it is basically be like, I think you should go see this movie. And then that person is like, why? And then you're like, I'm not telling you. So, like, that that's really all you could do because, you know, this twist happens, what, 10, 15 minutes in? It's 13. It's Because that's <laughs> what I said. I was like, the twist... Because, like, it's not like The Sixth Sense or something where this whole movie you're going to be waiting for this twist to happen. It's that something happens at the 13-minute mark that changes the game and it yeah. makes it a really fun and interesting movie. It's basically that the premise of this movie is a spoiler, which is why it's hard to talk about. But in general terms, I will say that... Um, Moss and Duplass both give really good performances. Uh, it starts out really interesting, and like the um, relationship between them is really interesting. But what I didn't love, I I liked it overall. But what I what made me like it instead of loving it is that at some point I think that the movie stops being as interested in the characters and becomes more interested in the plot and the plot mechanics. And to me, that was a little bit of a disappointment. So that's like the... I know that's very, very vague, but that's because I don't want to give too much away. I actually had the opposite reaction. When that started to happen, that's what made me more into it because I wanted more answers. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been satisfied. And that, yeah. kept, that kept me satisfied. I, I, like the, I like the twist and I like where it goes, but I felt like toward the end of the movie, it stopped being... I think, I think, it's, I was, I think I probably was with you for most of it because, you know, as Chrissy pointed out, it is what sets it apart from like just a typical uh, indie drama. But I thought, especially toward the end, to me, it lost sight of what I thought were the more interesting aspects of the film. I also want to point out that this is actually a really funny movie. Uh, Angie yes. and I saw it for the first time a few months ago at Tribeca, and it was a packed screening room, and everybody was laughing. Like it, it, It's got that really sharp observational humor where you're watching these two people interact in a way that is kind of painfully familiar, where like if you've ever been a person in a fight, like you're like, oh, no. If you've ever been the person at the tail end of a relationship where you have started to resent each other, and you start doing that thing where like every little tiny thing gets on the other person's nerve, and then like you get on, in a fight about the stupidest thing, and but it's because you both hate each other, the, like... Yes. I, it, yeah, it really it right. Nothing is played for laughs, but it's funny because you can relate to it. Exactly. It's like Sophie and Ethan, which are the characters' names, um, they're really relatable, uh, which is kind of a word that gets used a lot, but it's like, then they go into this kind of, this, this, vent, this twist, and um, it becomes a really fun kind of playground for the characters to play in, and, and their arcs become much more complicated and much more interesting. And I mean, it's Elizabeth Moss and Mark Duplass. You know, they're great actors, and they do such a great job with this. And um, I actually got to talk to them the other day, too, which was cool. And they have such an easy chemistry um, that, like, you believe that they're a couple that's had this, that's gone through a lot together, and it's, it's kind of instant. And the way they created the script, it has this kind of spontaneous feel, and not like the improv-heavy Apatow feel, where you just feel like people are making stuff up and going with it. Um, nothing against that, but that's not what this feels like. This just feels like a spontaneous conversation, and it makes you feel really invested and excited, and because of not just the twist, but also the new terrain it's cutting in romantic comedies by making these decisions, you know, you feel like you don't know what this what's going to happen. It feels no. like a genuinely unpredictable movie. That's true. It's, I mean, yeah, like, when you, we see so many of these movies, like, after a certain point, you can, like, kind of guess. Like, this one, it, I, I genuinely, one of the reasons I was, like, interested the whole time was because, like, I 
honestly have no idea where the fuck this is going. And the plot and the big plot device that we can't talk about yet is also a, it it kind of twists things around in a way that like makes you look at a subject that we've seen a lot of times before from a different angle. But maybe we should, at this point we should just go into spoilers. Yeah, yeah. let's Are do you it. Guys ready? Do that, I just want to say if you haven't yet watched the one I love and you're interested, and we obviously think you should see it, it's on VOD right now and iTunes. It's going to hit theaters August 22nd, and if you can see it in theaters, you definitely should because it's definitely a good theater movie to kind of hear the crowd responding as things happen and unfold. It's kind of a mystery. It's cool stuff, but it's on VOD now, so you don't have to wait. All right, so spoiler time. Let's talk about it. Who wants yeah. to explain what happened? Oh, I guess oh. I should because it was my plot thing, right? Go for it. Go for okay, it. Okay, so basically... Um, they, on the first night of going to this beach house, they see this guest house in the back, and they're like, oh, is anybody in the guest house? And one of them goes into the guest house and finds their partner in the guest house. But then they have this great experience, and it's great, then for some reason they're not mad at each other, and then she goes back to the house, and her husband's on the couch. And she's like, how did you get here? And, like, slowly they figure out that the guest house is kind of a place where a slightly better version of their partners exists, but only when they're in it. Yeah, so like when Elizabeth Moss goes into the guest house, she sees the version of Mark Duplass that she wishes that she had, and the, the vice versa for him, but because there are all these like weird little rules that they spend time exploring, and they can't go in together, and they can't like, yeah. So Yeah, and they, they like unfold it as the characters learn it, so it's kind of fun because we get to like experience this as we go. And It's a really very good. natural progression. It's not yeah. like exposition, like this is how this works. You, you're you with them Let's as they're, fe they're feeling it out, so that's yeah. why you get it. But like, and, and that's also why in the end, you know, you don't need the, the details of all the mechanics because you've experienced it with them, so in the end, like, there's, they're not going to get like a piece of paper with all the rules written out, so it just feels like a really real way to present some like totally supernatural, crazy little thing here. And also yeah, playing like to the kind of natural nature of this is that um, it's not like the better version of themselves. It's not like, you know, Sophie goes in there and instead of Mark Duplass, she has Michael Fassbender. You know, it's still Mark Duplass, but it's like... There's nothing wrong stuff. with Mark Duplass. No, no, but I'm saying, like, it's not like some weird fantasy thing where you go in and your partner's a totally different person. It's just right. that they're, they're, they're just a little, like... Her version, her preferred version of her husband, is just a little more easygoing, and he doesn't wear glasses, and he's uh, I he feel works like anyone out. Who's been, anyone who's been in a long-term relationship, I feel like you know, no matter how much you love the person you're with, there was always like things that you're like, I would like it if he, you know, was a little bit neater, or if, or if like she was less of a homebody, like things like that, like just little things where it's still the same person, but just like you know, tweaked in really subtle ways that make them a little bit more your ideal. And what's amazing about this movie is that they make those those distinctions very subtly. Like, it reminded me a lot of Metropolis, where there's, like, two different versions of this one character, and just, depend, just by the way the actress plays it, you can tell that, but in the movie they give you slight visual cues, because like we said, these are very subtle, subtle distinctions. And so, like, Sophie's guest house version is slightly more feminine looking. She pins her hair back. She puts a little more effort into how she looks um, than the regular Sophie does because she'll wear, like, sweatpants and not give a shit. I, and then, had like, to, I was honestly so impressed by the way that both... I mean, those visual cues definitely help, but it's also the performances. Like, they, they managed to do a really, really good job. I feel like it must be so difficult because, like we said, they're the same person but not, and I feel like it's really... it's. Playing two different characters is one thing. Playing one character is one thing. But this is kind of both. And I give so much credit to the actors for actually being able to pull that off. You keep it all straight. Like, I mean, we talked a lot about that on uh, when I met them earlier this week because I was just, like, confounded at how... And they shot this in 15 days, which is insane. It's incredible how Mark Duplass makes movies on, like, such such small, small budgets. This had a like a like more like a script slash treatment, so the dialogue wasn't written out. This is all kind of just improv, and they're cued to hit certain beats and that's it. So it's really pretty freaking amazing. And it just goes to show, you know, you've got Ninja Turtles which spent God knows how many millions of dollars. You don't need all that. You need a good solid story idea and then you're going to be fine. And an actress that has more than two facial expressions. That would help too. If Elizabeth Moss had been April O'Neil that would have been amazing. <gasps> oh, oh my god. god. Oh I know. God. I just made us all sad <laughs> because that, that wasn't what happened, didn't I? In the guest house version of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, April O'Neil would be played by Elizabeth Moss. Wow. Oh my god, that's totally true. 
I just blew your mind. The next mind. time any of us interviews him, uh, Elizabeth Moss, or has any interaction or reached into, we need to mention that. That's amazing. Um, I, really, I really wish I could rewind to, like, what, two years ago and, like, blast the internet with, no, cast her. That's such a good idea. Uh, I do just want to throw out here, because it's a fun fact I learned uh, the other day, and we wrote about it on Cinema Blend. Um, the costume designer for this movie is Rooney Mara. What? That's so random. Yep. Not that I doubt. I know she's, like, fashion girl, so I'm sure... Jeez. Well, basically, they were talking about how small the movie was, and I was talking to Charlie McDonald and saying I really liked the, uh, or McDowell, I don't know why I said it like that, uh, Charlie, talking to Charlie McDowell, the director, and I was like, I really like the costumes, can we talk about those? And he's like, yeah, my girlfriend did them, like, we had this small crew, and we were kind of pulling together, and, and she read the script and said, I'd like to do this, and like, I was, I was like, oh, what's your girlfriend's name? And he's like, my girlfriend's Rooney Mara. I didn't know. I didn't know that. But he, by the way, is the son of Malcolm McDowell and Mary Steenburgen. Yep. Which is why Ted Danson is the therapist in this movie for like five huh. minutes. Yeah, it's it's all that stuff. But yeah, it was. But she's not credited. So if you look at the credits and think I'm a liar, she's credited as Bree Daniels because they thought it might be weird to have like costumes by Rooney Mara. There but could she, be another Rooney Mara out there. That's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was like something I didn't like. Yeah, I thought that was really quirky. So just if you're if you're a Rooney Mara completist, then um, you have to see this for her costume work. That is true. So I don't know. I guess I guess what I was trying to get at earlier that which we could talk a little bit more about now that we are in the spoilers is that I like the I like the premise. I like the twist. I thought that toward the end it becomes more of a thriller, and that was the part where it started to me like to lose a little bit of interest because for me the most interesting thing about the twist was the way that it kind of turned these like typical relationship problems and like turned them around in a whole new light. And I don't know. I so I, liked it. I thought it the ending just became to me it, toward the end it became more of like oh we're interested in the thriller part and I was like well, well I, I thought know. it turned it into kind of an ultimatum in a way we don't typically see so I thought that fit very well with the whole relationship uh, momentum they had built so yeah I'm with you too I I mean I liked that even that last little bit where we have a little action there because mm -hmm. you know it's just a, it's a new part of the story that we hadn't gotten yet and it like really packs a nice punch for that ending before you cut to what eventually happens. Yeah and I don't want to say even though this is spoilers I don't want to say what the ending is because So I'm interesting hearing, though. Yeah because I'm hearing that depending on what you think happens in the ending it I, really, I it gives you a lot to think cut. about I thought it was incredibly clean cut, and, and I've been since corrected by people being like, no, that's not what it meant, so watch it. and mm. Tell us on Twitter what you thought it meant, because I'm curious. All right, so we all recommend this. Yes. Am I right? The one I love. Hey, hey, we got watch one. Watch it instead of Ninja Turtles. <laughs> all right, so that is all the time we've got for this week, but... You can catch us all over the place after you watch this while you're waiting for the next episode. We have a website, popcornprosecco.com. We are on Twitter at Popcorn Prosecco. Your, the YouTube channel, of course, Popcorn Prosecco. We are also on iTunes, so please go on there, rate us, submit your comments. We really want to know what you think. And then all three of us are all over the web as well. Who wants to take it first? I'll go. Uh, I'm at Christy Puchko. I write all over the place, but you can find the highlights of my work at DeccanandCriminals.com. Um, I'm I'm on Twitter. Or should I ask Roger? <laughs> I, I hear that. Um, I hear sorry. that. Yeah, he's getting hungry. Um, he is not on Twitter, but I am, and sometimes I post pictures of him. You can find me on Twitter at AJHAN, and I write for SlashFilm.com. And you can get me at P Nemiroff. That's my Twitter handle, and my writing is over at Collider.com. So thank you guys so much for watching, and we're going to see you next week. Me and my bros come together for the dope, bought the orange Lamborghini.